Welcome back to Adrenal Fatigue and Sleep Part 2. And again, I always acknowledge your time because I know how important it is. And when you're tired and exhausted and burnt out, you want to get right to the point. So that's what I want to do. And so let's start. And if you haven't got the first part of this fatigue webinar series, then make sure that you check out the links in the bio. We'll send you the follow-up uh, links to this recording. And then as always, if you want my PowerPoint presentation, you will be able to get that as well. So again, I always like to start off, who's this for? This is for men and women that are exhausted and burnt out and are just not doing well in terms of they're they're struggling they're not getting answers and i'm just going to exit for one second because i want to just make sure that i can see the chats only sent to you okay um one second i'm just gonna see if i can pause for a second here um you, oh i see okay so one second, um, I don't know how to do that. So you people want to see if you can see me and I, I, got, I forget how to do that. Give me one second here. Um, I think it's if we stop the share, I see, okay, here we go. So here's, here's where I am and then we will share and go right into the presentation. Sorry about that. So, okay, so as far as who is this for, sorry for the hiccups, guys, we'll get right into the presentation. This is for men and women that are exhausted and burnt out and are stuck. You're looking for answers. It's not for the lack of trying. I know what that feels like because I've suffered with fatigue and exhaustion myself. And you're, whether going to traditional approaches or alternative approaches, you are not getting answers or you know that each provider that gives you their take whether they're trying uh, to help you or not you can sense that and a lot of them are trying to help you and they want to help you but they don't have all the answers and you know there's missing puzzle pieces and the missing puzzle pieces is what's keeping you from tapping into what i truly believe to be a hidden energy reserve so this is for you. This is for you because I've suffered with that myself. And so if you've been struggling for years or you're just feeling stuck, this these are the presentations that I present with that in mind. So as far as in the next 45 minutes, what I always have as an underlining theme is that unfortunately the current health model is really set up to keep you sick. And that's because they treat symptoms. They don't treat the root cause of your problem. And really the root cause of it comes down to metabolic imbalance. It comes down to you're not creating energy at the level you need to. You're not making enough supply for the demand that you have. And your mitochondria at the cellular level are not combining the food you eat with the air you breathe to produce ATP and water. And whenever you take a medication, it is not addressing that fact. And that's what it really comes down to. And unfortunately, medication can be a stopgap. It can help you when you're at least working at the deeper, more cellular level of getting better, but it's not meant to be, okay, set it and forget it, pound the gavel and say, okay, that's it, Mrs. Jones, you need to be on this for your rest of your life. I, I don't believe that's the case. So, um, and I'm also going to be teaching you learning what not, uh, why you're not able to sleep and what that has to do with the adrenals and the HPA axis. And that's the reoccurring theme that the, this particular masterclass series is focusing in on. Certainly, we can talk about so many other things with hormone balance and testing, and we can talk about genetics, we can talk about viruses and Epstein-Barr. There's so many different things, mold, that we can talk about. We've just been talking about as it relates to insomnia and not being able to sleep. And that means falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up recharged. Uh, in part one, we talked about the circadian rhythm entrainment. We also talked about the role of your blood sugar. And those are seminars onto themselves. I really do feel that blood sugar, blood sugar stability, measuring your insulin levels, 
looking at your ketones and, and really learning how to get your blood sugar from roller coastering up and down and keeping it very, very stable throughout the day is a key metric for you to get your energy and health and understand what's happening at the cellular level. Uh, a lot more than than is being taught. So that will probably be one of the next courses that we will teach you guys. Um, but we're also talking about in this class today, what and why your excitatory neurotransmitters need to be in balance and why that's essential for sound quality sleep. In part one, we talked about glutamate. In part two, we're gonna be talking about histamine, dopamine, and adrenaline. And in part three, I was hoping to get part three in today, but part three, what we'll do is we will talk specifically about genes and genetic susceptibilities and what they play in the role of insomnia. Now, I want to just give you a primer on that is, is that people don't have the, the right impression of genetics. I just today had someone ask me if they had their, their BRCA gene measured on the genetic test because they're concerned right now and they're seeing their, their doctor and an oncologist and so forth. And I, I just reminded them, you know, millions of women that have tested negative for the BRCA gene have breast cancer and vice versa. Millions of women that um, do have the BRCA gene don't have breast cancer. So what gives? And what gives is the fact that genetics is, is the, the blueprint. And it's really when you understand genetics, you understand the environmental things that slow that enzyme down. So if your gene are, is already slow to begin with or upregulated and working too fast to begin with, and then the environmental triggers make it go faster or slower, and you don't have the proper nutrients for that specific gene that may be altered to work as effectively, then you know what you can do nutritionally, lifestyle-wise, uh, behaviorally, uh, supplementally, and it's not just treating the gene per se. I think that's a big lesson where it's, it's functional genomics, meaning you're looking at the nutrition, the lifestyle, the, the potentials, and really understanding and, and customizing what you can be doing. And I find that no truer to be essential than when you look at someone who has insomnia issues, as we talked about with histamine, or, or sorry, as glutamate, and as we'll talk about with histamine, and certainly with clearing out your neurotransmitters, because if you don't have the ability to have the nutrients available on top of the fact that your enzymes are altered in their ability to work, and that doesn't clear out your excitatory neurotransmitters as effectively, then that's what they call the warrior genes, where prehistorically or through generations, it was advantageous to not be able to break down your excitatory neurotransmitters as quickly because those that didn't break them down as quickly and had them around more lived longer and passed on their genes. And now with all these other environmental triggers that cause that dopamine levels or catecholamine levels to be sky high and you don't break them down, those levels are even higher than they've ever been. And that's what we're seeing. And so anyways, we'll, we'll move on to that. And my promise is always to give you a new way to think about, in this case, insomnia and adrenal health so that you can create energy on demand. I love that term, creating energy on demand. That means you have the metabolic flexibility to use protein, carbs, and fats and be able to create the amount of energy, the minimal amount of energy that you need to be able to do what you want, when you want, for as long as you want. And wouldn't that be nice? I, a lot of you forget about, okay, what would you be doing if you didn't have this? And a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't be doing this and I wouldn't be doing that and I wouldn't be doing this. But what we're really talking about is what would you be doing? And I think that's a really key. I'd like to do a, a masterclass on that in, in terms of if you had the energy to do what you wanted to do, what would that be? I bet a lot of you can answer that, but a lot of you can't answer that. And that's a clue in terms of fire ready aim you just want to be able to throw it all out there and put it into the universe what you want and 
and then feel that frequency and then start reverse engineering that along with, it's kind of like the analogy of, okay, you can take pills and, and medications at the 30,000 view foot to help you get better uh, at the short term, but at the long term, you got to get to the root cause. It's the same thing. You can, you can dream and, and focus and get aligned with what it is that you want at the 30,000 view foot, but you have to do the work to get there and, and you work on both. It, it's really working on both of those things. So let's talk about excitatory neurotransmitters. Um, sorry, I'm going too fast here. Um, so what I wanna talk about is, that's weird. Why is that doing that? It's going away. Um, anyways, the excitatory neurotransmitters are are chemical mediators or communicating messengers that help your body uh, deal with stress from a physical, a mental, emotional standpoint. And we talked about glutamate last time. Today, we're going to be talking about histamine. We're going to be talking about a catecholamine called dopamine and a catecholamine called adrenaline. That's what we'll be talking about today. And I'm not looking at the Q and A's until the end of the class, because when I do, then I don't find my cursor and then I can't see the screen. So let's start off with what is, the questions we'll be answering is what, what is histamine? How does the HPA axis or AKA adrenal fatigue relate to histamine and histamine reactions? And how does histamine most importantly impact my sleep? Well, histamine is an organic nitrogenous compound involved in your local immune system, as well as it regulates your physiological function in the gut, and it acts as a neurotransmitter. So two important points is a lot of people know about histamine when it comes to foods, and they're on low histamine foods, fermented foods, and foods that can be leftovers, kombucha, sauerkraut, kefir, uh, yogurts, and then even things like nuts and seeds. And then before you know it, you don't have any foods that you can be eating because you're also gluten-free and you're not eating any dairy. And then soy is off the plate. And then you also may not be able to eat oxalates. And, and I really do feel that there are people that have a lot of histamine intolerance and they do have to be careful. But when we go through what are the triggers that release histamine, stress, the environment, mast cell activation, iron oxidation, uh, danders, pets, pollens, alcohol, and foods. And I always say, if you're not addressing the major rocks that, that cause the big challenges and you're putting, and you're addressing the sand and the water and the air, you're missing out on space that you could put in a box. And so the analogy is, if you had rocks and you had pebbles and you had sand and you had water and you had air and you had to put them all in a confined area, what would you put in there first? You put in the rocks. Same thing when you're addressing your histamine issues is stress. Most importantly, this always comes down to stress and stress is physical, mental, emotional, real or perceived. And think about your perception of stress when you think when you're doing poorly and you're not sleeping and you feel awful and then you have less tolerance for being annoyed or being alerted or being stressed out, you're more trigger happy, you're more quick to fire. It doesn't take the same amount of stimulus to cause you to be overstimulated like a sound or a bright light or a change of your position or just a notice uh, alert that you've had that can really cause you to release that HPA axis, which is ultimately causing an increase in your histamine. And if you were to bet which would be the bigger inducer of histamine, would it be the food you're eating or the day-to-day -day stressors that you're experiencing, whether they're physical or perceived or mental or emotional, it's that stress modulation. And that's why I even got into histamine in the first place, because when you're exhausted and burnt out and you hear of this thing called adrenal fatigue, and you're not being believed by doctors because they're saying it's not a real thing, only to realize that it, it is a real thing, but the term stinks and there's so many things that go on and histamine control for HPA axis production is one of the main things that we're talking about today. So 
Um, it's released by the white blood cells into the uh, into the bloodstream. Sorry, going back on that last one. So just remember, histamine is involved in the GI tract, but it's also involved in the, the neurotransmitters of your brain and spinal cord and uterus for um, creating an immune reaction that is that is increased through stress. And so when when you have a potential allergen like a pet, a dander, a pollen, a food, and then stress, like we've talked about, that will cause the release of histamine from the white blood cells. And I love this diagram because you can see, if I could show you with a cursor, sorry that I can't, um, the mast cells are circled above the hypothalamus and the mast cells um, release histamine. And so what happens is the mast cells stimulate the HPA axis the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenals, ultimately causing cortisol, but the, also the mast cells stimulate histamine release, and cortisol is is made in order to quench histamine. So mast cells cause uh, the cortisol to go wild, right? Because on the one hand, it's signaling ma uh, the HPA axis to make cortisol, uh, whether it made histamine or not, and then number two, it makes histamine. So cortisol is charged with the job of controlling histamine. And so the inducers of histamine are stress, your immune system, foods, danders, pets, pollens, and anything that stimulates the mast cells. And when I go back, if you look below the mast cells, you'll see things like EMF, Lyme disease, xenobiotics, plastics, and, uh, and, and in our water, in our food supply, molds, glyphosates, um, oxalates. I mean, the, unfortunately, the environment is more detrimental than it's ever been for causing your mast cells and your HPA axis and your histamine to go haywire. And that's what I think is a big problem when it comes to not being able to sleep. So when it comes to histamine and sleep, the body regulates the amount of histamine in circulation to keep a fine balance. So one of the things I learned from a mentor, Dr. Bob Miller, is everything we learned in life can be can be extrapolated from Goldilocks and the three bears in the sense that that um, every, you don't want too little of something and you don't want too much of something. And our body, from a stress point of view, don't want any stress because then your body isn't flexible. But at the same time, you don't want too much stress because it could be overstretched. So you have to have a, and that's called a hormetic stressor. And so our body realizes, hey, we, we wanna have a certain amount of histamine, but we don't wanna have too much of that. And when there's too much of that, that's when you have that excitatory, can't turn the brain off, overstimulated, you are in fight or flight sympathetic mode. And I talked about this on a video earlier, antihistamines are known to cause drowsiness and histamines are a neurotransmitters for your central nervous system from one nerve to the other. So it's excitatory. So what we got to do is if we go back to this diagram, we, if we want to support our histamine, and I'll give you answers and solutions at the end of this, but if we want to support our histamine, we want to make sure we decrease the demand for histamine. Right. I mean, we want to also decrease the, the the production of it or the supply of histamine. But why is the supply of histamine rising? The supply of histamine is rising because the demand is making it rise. So if we can control the demand and that would be stress and foods and alcohol and environmental triggers and even EMFs and we'll get into dopamine and oxalates and iron oxidation. But when we control those demands, then we've already reduced the need to supply. And if we're not making as much histamine, especially if we're modulating our perception of stress, because we have the most power over that, when we modulate our perception of stress and we reduce the things that cause the activation of mast cells to produce histamine, then your sleep gets better. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what it should make sense. So as far as I will give you solutions to follow, and I always like to start like, who am I? Maybe you've never heard me before. Uh, my name is Dr. Joel Rosen, and we have uh, clients all over the world. I actually had a client today that 
uh, we were going to be starting up with. And she had a really cool cork board behind her of, of places that she's been in the world. And I, I thought we've, as a family, wanted to do that. But I also wanted to do that as a practitioner because we have clients in South Africa, Australia, um, Israel, in, in all over Europe, all over the US. And I don't say that to brag. I say that because today with, with COVID and the way that um, business is, is run, it makes the world so much smaller. And I used, used to have people that would say, well, I don't have a doctor in my area. And I, I now tell them that, well, you do, because all you need to do is go on Zoom and you have a doctor right beside you. Not only that, but you can learn from, from people all over the world and we share resources. And I say it's the best of times and the worst of times. Just like I said, there's all these environmental triggers and danders and pollens and pesticides and sprays and heavy metals and pollutants, exhaust lack of minerals in our soils, the big pharma and big industry only wanting to make major money and dopamine and light bulbs and electricity and EMFs. I mean, that list goes on and on. And that is a terrible thing. But on the flip side, well, the world is getting more advanced and, and more rewarding. And it really comes down to your perception. What, what do you see it? Do you see that the sky is falling? Or do you see that the, the skies are blue? And I think you can you can feel bad for a little bit, but ultimately it's that frequency and that energy of abundance in, instead of limits that, that help your body heal and reduce the amount of histamine that needs to be made and, and the, the amount that is being made. Does, does that make sense? So we coach clients all over the world. We have over 300 coaching clients and we teach them the strategies just like we're teaching you. I also have a podcast and we speak at biohacking conferences. And I really like to think of it as being a leader in the functional medicine world. And I think what, that, what comes with that is being a teacher. And that's why we do these classes because I, I know how expensive and how, how costly it is to to see a doctor like myself because insurance doesn't cover it. You spent thousands of dollars on tests or co-payments or medication or supplements, or you've lost out on thousands of dollars from not working or having to um, miss out time or be on disability and, and be frustrated. I, I get all that. And my goal down it, it now and, and 10, 15 years from now is really to have the democratization of healthcare where the empowerment is in you and understanding yourself and being able to become metabolically healthy and, and have really healthy foods and be able to know what you need to do to get healthy and get off the medication because medication never treats the causes, it treats the symptoms. So anyway, that's my little um, soapbox and I'll get off that for now. Um, the other thing I want you to do is I want you to get the free resource that we've produced. Um, it's the Truth About Adrenal Fatigue Roadmap and basically it talks about the five landmines that you need to avoid to make um, your exhaustion worse if you, if you do see them. And I really like this, it tells you why they don't teach about adrenal fatigue in the medical schools. And it talks to you about four truths about what doctors don't want you to know. And then it, it, I really don't think that HPA axis dysfunction is a good enough term. And, and then we get into the five landmines. It's a free download and um, it has lots of information in there. So go to that. So let's talk about the, the catecholamines. Um, the catecholamines, are derived from the amino acid tyrosine, and they also help to make phenylalanine. Now, phenylalanine is in a lot of the um, aspartames, so you got to be really careful. I didn't have that as my solutions uh, and what you can be doing, but one of the main things that you could be doing to help with your sleep, help with your glutamate, help with your uh, catecholamines is um, removing any artificial sweeteners uh, or any artificial foods or looking at the label and reading things that you can't pronounce. Ultimately, the more natural, growing, God's made food that you eat, the healthier options you have. The more that we process foods and put additives in there and 
the the food companies aren't dumb. They they do this because it makes it look prettier, but it also makes it taste yummier and it makes it addictive. And there's a real addictive quality to that because that's that dopamine dopamine hit, that adrenaline hit that builds up a withdrawal, uh, a tolerance, an addiction for it. And the best way to avoid that is to not eat it. And when you don't eat it, then you can fall asleep better. And I think it's important to do some health classes on dispelling the myth of, well, it's too expensive, Joel, to do that. I, I know when you eat um, natural foods, it, organic foods, it costs more and it takes longer. But I, I think that's a, that's a sacred cow that can be tipped over. Yes, it costs more short-term wise, but long-term wise with missed work and, and infirmary, uh, being sick and, and not being able to, and spending a lot of money on, on healthcare bills down the road, not to mention the crippling impact it's having on, on our society. Um, cheap is expensive. And I don't mean to say cheap in the sense that it's cheap, but saving a little bit of money now is not going to save you a lot of money. It's going to cost you in the end. And I think that if as a society, we come together and demand the farm bill change and that the, the government starts to uh, give incentive for farmers to be able to grow crops that are healthy, um, I think things will change. But either way, our goal is to, is to teach you that you can prepare a healthy meal in a short time that isn't going to break the bank, that's going to make you feel better, and it's cheaper than going to the doctors, buying your medication, being sick, missing work, and ultimately the return on investment is a high quality of life that you should be living. Um, that's a big thing that I wanna teach you guys. Um, included in the catecholamines are epinephrine, which is adrenaline, noradrenaline, and dopamine. And basically the release of these hormones um, are because we're in the fight or flight response. So going back to this diagram here, when we have those mast cells that stimulate the HPA axis and it stimulates the adrenal gland. In the adrenal gland is the cortex and in the adrenal glands is the medulla. And I'd like to draw a diagram where you have the medulla and then that shows the cortisol being circled, but then you also have, or sorry, the, the cortex, which shows the cort cortisols being made. And then you have the medulla or the inner part of the adrenal glands. That's where the um, where these catecholamines are formed, and it's not necessarily released from ACTH. It's released from a nervous system signaling, and that's why you have that immediate adrenaline rush. I, I hate this example, but if someone held you up at gunpoint, you would have that adrenaline rush where your heart rate and your breathing, and you just get that instant rush. That takes immediate responses because ultimately your brain is signaling to the inner part of the adrenals to make those catecholamines right away. And then what happens is then in the blood supply, the ACTH takes a little bit of time to kick in. And that's where cortisol is meant to get you back down into proper, um, proper sort of downgrading the engine when you've been revved up so high. But suffice it to say, when you've been stressed, that causes your both your adrenal gland, medulla, inner part, and the outer part to release dopamine, catecholamines, and cortisol. So um, the next slide is let's talk about dopamine. So dopamine, I mean, you guys all probably know what dopamine is. It's involved in in focus, in pleasure, in pain, in memory, in motivation, in drive, in mood, addictive dis disorders. I, I remember hearing the lecture of, if you could put a holic behind it, you know that person has a dopamine issue. So whether it's a shopaholic, a readaholic, a alcoholic, whatever that aholic is, that person has dopamine disorders, whether it's they become dopamine uh, desensitized, so they need more of it to get that same response, or they're not producing it and they need more of it. Um, either way, it's either low, it's high, and that's causing major challenges. And in today's digital world, just think about it. I mean, you have your phone, you have an alert for your email, you have a, an alert for a post, you have an alert for a like, 
you're on different social medias, you have to check your ringer, you have to check your phone. I mean, we are, whether we like it or not, addicted to technology. And we, we don't realize it, but it is. And what that does is that drives up your HPA axis that puts you in fight or flight. And that requires energy to clear out those excitatory neurotransmitters. And we're trying to fix this through taking Ambien or having melatonin. And while these can be stop gaps that can be helpful, what about looking at your, your phone? And what about looking at your, your, your computer and checking your email and just being hopped up on that all day long. It, it, we don't realize it's happening, but it is. And we almost become conditioned like Pavlov's dogs, where we repeatedly pair things to neutral stimuli, such as a bell, but then it becomes something that automatically becomes conditioned. Um, and we, they noticed this with dogs when they would salivate to the bell and when they brought food, but then they would still salivate just to the ringing of the bell without the food. And that's what's happening to us. We get addicted to just technology, whether we realize it or not. And that creates a lot of dependency and um, addictions and shortness of focus and concentration. And we're just doing multitasking too many things. And that winds up your brain. Um, and you'll see on this pathway here, dopamine stimulates your mast cells, which stimulate histamine. And as we know, mast cells stimulate your HPA axis and mast cells stimulate histamine. So why the science, Joel? Why are you giving me the science? Because this is the rabbit holes that I went down when I was thinking, okay, I heard of this thing called adrenal fatigue and I did a saliva test and my cortisol was down and I took licorice root or an adaptogen and it didn't make me better and then doctors don't believe in it and they say that i'm crazy that i just want attention or i should be put on an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication or i should go and talk to someone but i know i'm not depressed i know i'm not anxious and i i don't need therapy i need help i need answers so I did the answers on my own, only to find out that it goes so much deeper than the adrenals. It goes deeper than the mitochondria. It goes to the perfect storm of the environmental triggers like Wi-Fi and technology and notices and alerts and comments and likes and emails and all of these things that we get addicted to. And I, I think if you've seen that, the, the experiment, the social experiment or whatever they called it, where Napa or sorry, not Napa, but the Silicon Valley, they do these things on by for financial gain. They, the more eyeballs, the more clicks, the more attention they have, the more that they get sponsors and and basically commerce. And while while that's good in in the ways that we get a lot of information. It's bad because it causes us, our brains to be wound up all the time. Does that make sense? So when we have genetic susceptibilities, it makes it that much worse. So as far as catecholamines, adrenaline and, and norepinephrine, we just talked about it where basically it's released by the inner part of the adrenals and it's part of the fight or flight response. Now, I circled a, another diagram that we, we do a lot of, so you can see that phenylalanine and tyrosine, they basically produce dopamine, adrenaline, and epinephrine. And we'll get into this next week when we talk about the genetics, because a lot of people don't have the ability to recycle the nutrients to make their neurotransmitters. And when you don't have the ability to recycle your nutrients to make your neurotransmitters, what do you do? You have more likelihood to be addicted. You have more likelihood to want that fix, whether it's uh, Amazon telling you that you your package just arrived or it's, um, it's another uh, alcohol drink or it's going to porno sites or it's going to um, things on the internet with social media, but we're addicted. And when we don't have the ability to make our neurotransmitters effectively, or break them down, we have problems. And I always found that fascinating in, in, in our bodies where on the one hand, you have insulin, where you have insulin resistance, where if insulin's too high, it doesn't allow glucose to go into the, into the cells. 
but yet when insulin is too low, you don't have enough so that it doesn't let glucose get into the cells. So it happens when you have too much of a neurotransmitter or hormone or too little of a neurotransmitter or a hormone, it causes the same physiological response in a lot of ways. Now, it may take a lot of different pathways to get there, but when we have too much dopamine, too much adrenaline, too much epinephrine, and we can't clear it out, that's when our bucket is overflowing and we can't turn our brain off and we can't sleep. When we have too little of it, we're not able to, to stimulate our brain or we're not able to even create a, a, a stress response and that doesn't allow us to sleep either. So it creates a lot of the same effects. And, and that's, again, you'll see that I circled this because when those mast cells cause the adrenals to go off, it causes your catecholamines and your epinephrine and your adrenaline to go off. So what can we do about it? Well, understand all the things that stimulate your mast cells and that's really stress. And that can be environmental things, perceived things, electronics, EMFs, oxidation of iron, uh, free radicals, pesticides, sprays, Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr disease, dopamine release, histamine release, glutamate release, all of the things create more excitatory stress to your adrenals, which causes your cortisol and your catecholamines to go off. And what we really need to do is reduce all those things that cause the the mast cells to, to go off. And we also want to increase the clearance of histamine. And then we want to do the proper testing. So as far as histamine intolerance goes, histamine intolerance is the reaction to foods that are high in histamine. It's not an allergic reaction. And ultimately what happens is you may not have the ability to lower that histamine that's overflowing and it's lowered through an enzyme called DAO, which we measure on a genetic test. And it's also lowered by um, methylation. That's why if you have MTHFR, it can make it very difficult to clear out that histamine as well. And that's typically what histamine toxicity could be is because you, you have a deficient DAO or you have a deficient methylation to clear that histamine out. And as far as, did I miss something there? Uh, no. So um, that's the same slide. So as far as when your body has too much histamine that exceeds how much you can clear it out with, that becomes histamine intolerance. Um, as well in, with females, they're in their various phases of cycles, they'll have higher levels of histamine when their estrogen levels are higher or if they're not clearing out that his estrogen effectively because they don't have the ability to do that then that can make that histamine higher. And, and you may find as a female that you have phases of the month where you sleep better versus phases of the months that you don't. Then you know there's an estrogen relationship there. Um, and after histamine is released, we need to break that down. So again, we want to focus on the supply side, meaning we don't want to produce so much of it. And we, are, we, don't want, we also want to increase the clearance of it. So those are the things that we can focus in on. Uh, as far as foods that are higher in histamine, again, uh, a lot of people do have reactions to histamine because they can't clear it out effectively. Uh, fermented foods, wides, kombucha, sauerkraut, cured meat, soured foods, dried foods, most citrus foods, aged cheeses, nuts, vegetables, smoked fish. Now, again, I'll give you this list, but I don't want you to just limit the amount of foods that you're eating because those could be the rocks, the pebbles and the sand versus the big boulders that need to be addressed first. Um, as far as dopamine, we can reduce our, our de demand for dopamine production by avoiding stimula stimulation and um, not socializing or not um, having like what they call a dopamine fast um, whether it's meditation or going on a retreat, on a vacation, um, those are things that you can be doing as well. So, and then lastly, what I wanted to um, bring up was the fact that we started to private label our own products. And when I say private label, not only private label, but formulate. So what I've found is there's some really good products that are out there. Um, if you've tried DAO before, you know if it works for you, but it's a really expensive product. 
And I found with a lot of the formulations, there's too many things in there. And some of them have B6 in there. And I find that even though B6 is a cofactor, I find that B6, a lot of people have irritability with B6. So we formulated this only with kidney powder and with apple polyphenols. And we have at a really good price point of $40. And I find that you can't find a Dow enzyme less than $50, $60, $70. And we got a special for tonight where um, we give $15 off your your order for listening to this webinar. Um, So what I was able to do is cut out a lot of the extra ingredients that you could react to and put more kidney porcine powder in there so that you have a stronger clearance. And those apipolyphenols are really good to lower your histamine as well. We call that cell rehist. The other one we have is the cell recom and it's an AM formula. It's got magnolia bark, not at high intensities, I think 75 milligrams. And it also, which is amazing at lowering your glutamate levels. And the reason why I have this as a daytime, because a lot of people get anxiety when they first get up and they got the day to take on. It can be taken at nighttime, but it doesn't have as strong as much uh, magnolia bark as, as the PM one does. And this will help to lower your glutamate levels, which ultimately, if that's being controlled, will help your sleep levels. And it's got danshin, lemon balm, and threonate in there. And then lastly, we have the PM one, which is the magnolia bark, but there's 200 milligrams of the Hinocchio, which is the active ingredient, it also has passion flower and theanine and valerian extract and hops. And so really excited because I'm now able to produce these in small batches, which means there's no toxic tag alongs or excipients or flow through agents or um, silicone dioxide or magnesium steric, which if you've been taking any supplement for any length of time, those are known to be really bad things to add in your supplements. So um, what we're doing right now is we're giving a special, you can go to um, cellrenew.myshopify.com. That will be changing once we add it to our website. Uh, However, Um, Those are the ones that we have. And then you can use the discount code webinar 15, and that will give you 15% off as well. We do have a further 15% off on if you do it on a subscription. So it gives you an opportunity if it's a $40 product to save 15% and then on top, which is $6, but then on top of that, another 15% from, from that. So that's a, that's a pretty good deal by the end of the day. So um, next week, we're going to be talking about adrenal fatigue and sleep part three. And that's when we're going to be talking about the genetics and what specific genes and nutrients and cofactors and, and inhibitors, environmental triggers that make these worse, that would make your sleeping worse. And that could be things like EMF exposures, believe it or not, or glyphosates or mold or gluten or oxalates. Uh, We'll be talking about all of those things in our next class and we'll do that next week. And so what I'll do now is I will open it up for questions so that you guys can ask me questions here. So um, let me exit out of here and then come over to where the questions are so we can go through that. So how to clear out neurotransmitter with systemic candidiasis with low adrenal burnout. So again, C- Caitlin, what I would say on that is you want to make sure that you're, you're not producing as much neurotransmitters in the first place to have to clear out. Now that's notwithstanding the candidiasis. We're just talking about dopamine, glutamate, histamines, those major things that we talked to adrenaline, we talked about what are all the things that stimulate the mast cells and dopamine and artificial sweet, artificial seasonings and flavors and sweeteners, natural flavors, um, MSGs, isolates, concentrates, and protein powders. Those things are laden with glutamate and uh, phenylalanine that will drive up your need to clear out your neurotransmitters. Of course, your perception of stress is going to increase your need to to clear out those neurotransmitters. But as it relates to candidiasis, 
you know, I don't believe in the Diflucan antifungal approach because what's been shown is, is that that will ultimately reduce the, the candid candida, which is a, is a commensal bacteria for protection. And what that means in English is typically the reason your body makes can, candida is protective. In this case, if there's oxalates or mycotoxins um, or heavy metals or other harmful toxins, your body will produce more candida to have to, to, to sequester and deal with that effectively. And then when we go and blast away the candida, then we make those things that it was sequestering more volatile in our body. So what you wanna make sure you're doing is you're addressing those things, binders, removing refined food, sugars, feeding the gut and, and saving the liver. Um, without getting too much into depth, that's what I would su suggest. As far as molybdenum, I have mixed feelings on that. I used to make a lot of recommendations on molybdenum for helping to clear out sulfites. Uh, but what we've seen now is that molybdenum is a copper chelator and copper is necessary for making your oxygen uh, be combined with ATP to make food, uh, to make energy. Uh, stop eating late. I got to do the work helps with clearing. Yeah. I mean, definitely eating in a, in a, in an ideal time frame as well. Um, hi, Corey. I hope you're doing well. I tried magnolia extract before, and it seemed to make me anxious OCD worse. Have you ever heard of that happening? Could that have been a coincidence? Uh, I'm not sure. It, anything is possible. Um, I don't, I don't know. I would want to do everything that I just mentioned to Caitlin in terms of, have I addressed my perceptions? Have I addressed all the foods that I'm eating? Um, have I enough magnesium? That's a good thing I'd be thinking about is because magnesium is a major cofactor for clearing out uh, glutamate and, or do I have enough ATP being produced because that GAD enzyme needs magnesium, it needs ATP, it needs B6. So if you did the um, magnolia or the hinocchial and it wasn't served with those other factors, that might be the reason why. So I, I, would, I would think that it's possible. I wouldn't doubt that it was. It, it is possible. I would be thinking about um, getting extra bees like rice bran or beef liver or bee pollen or leafy green vegetables with a lot of good magnesium, Epsom salts, oils, or glycinate or malate. I usually like five to 10 times your weight in milligrams and then see if that magnolia bark would be helpful. I, that would be what I would suggest. After having Lyme, I've been taking hydrocortisone for eight years and I still feel like I need to be, a, a, like I need it to be alert and awake. Um, will hydrocortisone ever heal my adrenals? So it's a good question. It, it's, it's, so when you take the hydrocortisone, the, the theory is, is that you're getting the exogenous production of cortisol so that your adrenals don't have to produce it themselves. The only problem with that is, is that it, it, it can mess up the HPA axis in terms of, I find that that pituitary gets offline. And I also find that if there's still Lyme or co-infections, mast cell activation, environmental triggers, genetic susceptibilities, mineral deficiencies, cofactor deficiencies, all of the above, then you're not doing enough to address why you needed to have the hydrocortisone to begin with meaning you still have to do the things that were needed to do, even though you're taking the, the pressure off the, the adrenals. The analogy would be if you had a worker and they couldn't do the job anymore, but then someone came in to do the work, would that worker um, finally have the ability to come and do the job? They may, but not if there's so many things in the job that they have to do that they're undermanned anyway, so that no matter how much they rest when they come back to the job, they they never addressed why they got tired in the first place. That problem is still there. Does that, does that make sense, Karen? I hope it makes sense. Um, so if there's any other questions, I'll go to, I think there was, I think that was it. Maybe there was in the chat boxes, maybe, I don't know. Answered, dismissed. 
I think that was it, guys. If you have any other questions, let me know. Uh, and then we can answer that. If someone were to book a call with you and they want the process look like in terms of uncovering what is the specific problem. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we, when we do a, a call, what we do is we troubleshoot, not going into the weeds because it's only 45 minutes. And sometimes I have to say, Mrs. Jones, do I have permission to pull you out of the weeds? Because I want to know where we are now. And if it's relevant, most of the times it is relevant, but we really want to figure out, okay, where are we now? Like, what have we tried? What's showing up? What are you still dealing with? What, what is still getting worse or what's still there? And, and then we can troubleshoot what are all the other systems that are involved? And, and then from there, how's it impacting you? What are you not able to do? And is it, what's the impact financially and not financially? I mean, I, you, you could be spending lots of money on insurance to, to pay for it. You could be spending a lot of money on medication and missing work. And I want you and I to both get clear on that, to realize how much this is impacting you. Uh, and then based on all of that, where are you now? What have you tried? How's it showing up? What's all involved? What's the cost, both financially and not financially, and you not getting better? What's your biggest fear with all of this? Then once I get clear on that, now I want to get clear on what would be different if you didn't have this. And I always like to know, what would you want to see that you haven't been seeing from the other providers? Meaning you wish they would have done this, that, or the other, which they never did. Most of the time I hear, I wish they would have listened to me. I wish they would have uh, put the put all the puzzle pieces together because they get little bits of pieces from here, here, and here, and no one really seems to understand all of it. And I also would wish they do the right testing. And then I want to know um, what I need to do. And I, and then I, and then more importantly, when I do it, I want to see improvements. And I always ask someone, what does the improvements look like? What would you know? What would you see that? What would you need to see to know it was working? And it's an obvious question, but it's not so much an obvious question in terms of. I would, I would notice that when I go to bed, I don't stare you, you know, out into space and my mind's racing. I, I could feel that drop in excitability. And I do feel a little more recharged when I wake up. And then I, I feel like it, I crashed at, at four instead of three, or I know that I had more focus and I had more drive or had more motivation. And then as I start getting more momentum, then I have the ability to want to keep the house clean and not feel so far behind. And then I'd be able to look in front of the mirror and then smile and then go out for a walk. And then I, once I get and then I want to know, okay, what would you be doing if you ultimately had the energy you want? And then by the time we're done, my goal would be to figure out how to reverse engineer that based on what you've told me, what do we need to do? These are the things you've done. These are the things you haven't done. These are the things that are being impacted and this is what would be doing differently. And this is how you would know it would be working. Here's all the things that I think you need to do. And then when we're done, if I feel I could help you, I'll tell you what it would look like down to the dollar. There's no obligation to do any work. So that way you feel like you got value for the call, whether we do work together or not. So that's sort of the anatomy of what, what a call looks like. I do say though, make sure that you, I look for three qualities. I want to know, are you decisive? Like, do you know that this needed to be fixed yesterday? Number two, are you coachable? And the coachable is a really important one. I'm not going to try harder than you. I've tried harder than you with a lot of people and I get burnt out and I'm recovering from burnout and I don't want to care more than you. I, I want you to care just as much as me in getting you better and realizing that if you don't want to do what we suggest you do, you tell me so that I'm not surprised by it and I can agree with it or you're seeing another doctor and they want you to do this, then you and I can discuss it together and see what the best decision is for you. And, and you are the captain of the ship. I'm just there to help you guide the, the journey, if you will. But at the same time, I don't want you just blindly following what I tell you to do. I want you to give me feedback on what you're noticing. It's never going to be linear in terms of you're just going to get better, better, and better. You're going to have some setbacks. You'll, you will have thought that something we suggested would have made you worse or better, but it made you the opposite and realize that that's a good thing because now we can figure out why you went left when you should have gone right. But if we're not having that communication, 
then please don't sign up because that person has to be coachable. And then lastly, I always say you have to be resourceful. And, and I do mean that financially, but I also mean it lifestyle wise and making changes and having paradigm shifts and realizing your new normal is not what it used to be, but also realizing that there's no value you can place on not being able to walk your daughter down the aisle or be able to get off the couch or be that cool grandfather or grandmother that isn't not able to get themselves off the floor can go and travel and not cancel out on your friends when they say let's go out and you thought you could but then you who were you fooling when the time came around you knew you were going to have to cancel on them and you're not able to to do the work at the capacity that you you have been and it's it's impacting you financially. And I want you to think about it as a financial investment and a return on that investment. So I didn't put the link to it today on this coaching call, but I will put the link to it uh, at the bottom of wherever you're watching the replay. And if there's any other questions, let me know. If not, then, oh, it looks like Kristen beat me to it. So she did put the link to it. Thank you, Kristen. And um, I'm grateful for Kristen for, for doing a great job with, with us. And um, that's it, guys. So if that's helpful for you, I hope it was. I do get a lot of feedback on it's too scientific -y. Uh, Keep break it down. And it is very complicated information. And I do want to make it less scientific -y, if you will. Um, but I also want you to understand what's going on so that when you are ready to take over the steering wheel, you'll know how to navigate the journey on your own. And that requires know-how and and it's a, it's a balance between scientific objective physiology metabolic health 101 but it's also intuitive i had a great interview with the biohacking babes the other day and we'll be publishing that in a couple of weeks and they really talk about check out their podcast it's called biohacking babes and they talk about the importance of intuition and listening to your body and not feeling wrong for it uh, and especially with women when they're maybe in their cycle and they're in their last half or the last phase of their cycle and they're craving more carbs and feeling guilty for it. But once you start to intuitively listen to your body and, and understand the objective clues that are telling you that what you're feeling intuitively is right, not wrong. And then we put a psychological barrier on it as being wrong and not right. And then we start spinning our wheels and becomes overwhelmed and we can't sleep. So think about the intuitiveness of, of your healing nature and listening to your body and reestablishing that connection and not just real thinking that everyone is the same. And because Mary is doing better and she's doing keto, you should be doing better and doing keto. It just doesn't work that way. And that's part of the education process and, and understanding the science, but also balancing it with understanding Mary or understanding yourself. So anyways, guys, I hope that's really, really helpful for you. And I look forward to the next uh, masterclass part three uh, next Wednesday. So you guys have a wonderful evening and I'll see you on the, on the next go around. Thanks guys.